This is the culmination. This is the OG signing day. It used to be the only one. Now it's the second one. Not a ton has changed, but still it's a big day on the college calendar. You know, some people think that Groundhog is more accurate than recruiting rankings. <laughs> <laughs> to prove that that's not the case, right? But uh, yeah, definitely a little bit of a different feel from the past national signing days. But I think a couple years in, we're used to this one being the uh, kind of the, the runt Groundhog, right? Right. I think the portal has changed so much about recruiting. I, I look at it as the new junior college recruiting, right? You know, very few programs in the past could make a living on junior college recruiting. I think Bill Schneider at Kansas State was the most famous one. So not everybody got involved in junior college recruiting. So what's different about the portal replacing it is everyone is involved with, with the portal. The other thing is think about all the high school players that won't sign today yeah. because of the portal and schools using their scholarships for that. So it's even going to change the landscape of junior colleges. It may help the junior college recruit more high school guys because the portal's taking away scholarships that they ordinarily would get. Yeah, it's interesting you talk about the portal, how much has changed, and these programs have had to set up pro uh, infrastructure inside their program so that they can just chase those uh, guys that are going into the portal. But uh, Alan, as you mentioned, when you look at this particular signing day now, it really isn't as eventful as it used to be. And right. I think that's just the, time, uh, the times that we are living in right now as far as recruiting is concerned. And that being said, it is still a chance to give a, a fuller picture of the recruiting world because on the first one, maybe 90% of recruits are locked in, but it's not 100%. Well, now we have 100%. So here are the headlines on this final 2022 signing day. Ohio State's back where it often is on top of the Big Ten. Couldn't do that on the field this year, but at least in recruiting, it's back at number one in the league where Ryan Day has been every year he's been the head coach. Penn State had such a great class, it's tied for the best Nittany Lion group in the modern era. Sixth in the nation, including, among other big names, a running back who is the Gatorade National High School Football Player of the Year. Turmoil in Ann Arbor? Maybe with the head coach rumors, not so with the signing day class. Another very good one for Jim Harbaugh, another top 10 one for him. And for the first time in a while, he got the highest ranked kid in state to stay home in Ann Arbor. Indiana, it's official, has not just brought in the best football recruiting class in program history, it has done so in a landslide, absolutely crushing its previous mark. And oh, by the way, that's not even counting the big time work they did this year in the portal. Michigan State seems to be thrilled with its head coach, as Mel Tucker not only guided the team to 11 wins this past fall, but now brings in to East Lansing a top 20 nationally ranked recruiting class on top of that, the third best MSU group in the modern era. Iowa has the distinction of being the highest ranked of all the Big Ten West teams. They closed really strong. Looked like a weak class a few months ago. Not so much now. Making it back-to-back -back top 30 classes nationally. And Rutgers and Greg Schiano. He has indeed made an immediate impact in Piscataway. Their second highest regarded group in program history. That's thanks in large part to his ability to corral the top talent in the state of New Jersey and keep them playing for the home school team. Now, all those are storylines in the Big Ten. We're going to talk big picture, those small picture storylines. We're going to talk with multiple head coaches coming up for the next couple hours. But there's also one massive storyline that's just this cloud kind of lingering above the Big Ten right now. And I alluded to it in Ann Arbor. No one seems to know what the future is with Jim Harbaugh. The stories are he is meeting with the Vikings all day today about their head coaching job. Maybe we'll know by the end of this evening, maybe by the end of the show, if he's taken it. But that leads to a lot of questions, gentlemen, about the future of Michigan, about who takes that job, <laughs> and about how it affects the recruits, not just the future of Michigan recruiting, but the way it affects this current group, which again is a top 10 class. Yeah, I've been getting that question a lot the last couple of days is what happens to these guys? What can they do if the head coach leaves? Are they able to get out of their NLI? At this point, they would have to ask for a release from that and be granted that release if they're already enrolled. Then at that point, they can enter the transfer portal I don't really see that happening with this group. You've already had some staff changes. Director of Player Personnel Courtney Morgan went to Washington. You had Mike McDonald go to the Ravens. You had Sean Nua go to USC. Recruiting class stayed together through that. A lot of them have built really good relationships with the coordinators and the assistants that are still on staff. Assuming those uh, staff members are retained, I see this class staying largely intact for Michigan. So they have some options if they wanted to leave because of Jim Harbaugh taking another job, but I don't really see that happening with this group. I think they're pretty committed at this point. 
I think long term it'll have very little effect. Uh, I think short term, if Josh Gaddis is the head coach that would succeed Jim Harbaugh, which I think there's a possibility that that would happen, it may not have any impact on this class right now. But if, if Jim does leave and someone wants out of their national letter and they're not already enrolled, that would open up their recruiting. Now, you, if, you're the, if you're the young person in high school, you might have to jump through some official hoops, but most likely you could go back out and sign with whatever you want. And the last thing I'd say, Howard, is all the student rights, the, the transfer portal, the NIL, this is one of the reasons. Mm -hmm. I'm a high school prospect that signed with Michigan with a head coach who's interviewing on the day that we could sign a scholarship. So, again, all these changes that some people are pushing back on, I think all the changes are good because it gives the student athletes more rights, and this is an example of why they need more rights. Now, one of the ways that fans will push back, right, they'll say, well, you, you chose Michigan. You didn't choose the head coach. You, you're coming to Michigan, and, and there's going to be a group of players that they absolutely chose Michigan for Michigan and what it'll be able to do for them on and off the football field. So that's a good thing. But for players to have that opportunity to change their mind, I think is absolutely the right decision. I believe that this staff, well, this team will probably stay in place, particularly if Josh Gaddis gets an opportunity to be the head coach, because you talk about a great recruiter. That's exactly what he is, and the AD has done an outstanding job of making hires. You need to only look at his track record where he's been. He's always seemed to be able to pick the right guy to run the program if, and I say if, he needs to make that decision in this situation for Michigan. Yeah, and Josh is also a outstanding offensive coach, and that's, that's the trend lately. But what about the players that do come? I mean, if Jim leaves or stays, are they thinking he, there's a possibility he doesn't want to be here, right. but he wants me to come. So I think there's a lot of layers to this thing, but again, I think, I, I think the fact that the student athlete now has more ability to leave one school under any circumstance and go to another is the right thing. And you mentioned Josh Gaddis, but the staff is full of strong recruiters. Yes. Mike Hart, Sharon Moore, yeah. they added Steve Klinkscale and Ron Bellamy. Those men are a large reason that they built this class, yeah. and they're still going to be there from what we know. Yeah. And by the way, this is all if the Vikings yeah. want him. Or if the Miami owner says he wants to break what he said, which is not to take Harbaugh away, there's a chance that doesn't happen, and he goes back, and that makes everything fascinating. Also fascinating the timing of this, right? It's his best season by far, beats Ohio State, wins the Big Ten, makes the playoff. But in seven years, that's the only time he's done all three of those things. More on Michigan and their class coming in just a little bit. But for now, we turn to the recruiting rankings. Here's sort of the overall big picture on signing day. Three Big Ten teams have top 10 classes nationally. Five of them are in the top 25. You got a couple more hovering right around 30. It's a very good group of classes for the conference. And some perspective, a decade ago, the Big Ten had only five classes in the top 40 overall. This year, almost doubling that. If you look at the overall national rank of this year's teams, 29.5 is the average. That is much better than last year and the last few years, which were also considered pretty darn good years for the league. So we got into a brief idea of some of the big picture topics and storylines to keep an eye on today as we go through the course of the next few hours. Let's dive a little bit deeper on that. You were going to talk about how the changes that we've seen from when we were here just a week before Christmas, there's not that many. There are some changes, but not a ton from what we saw in December. Especially not from what we were used to when there was this was the primary signing day. And I think it's definitely converted to this point to where the early signing period is really National Signing Day. So Nebraska had some additions today. Uh, there's some other schools who may add some guys here and there, but really this isn't a newsy day. What this day is about is now we have a better chance to know how these guys fit into the roster. Uh, we, have a, we have more knowledge of who's going into the draft. We have more knowledge of uh, if any players are transferring out and if this class has a chance to come in and contribute immediately. That's more of what it's about. As far as news breaking and new additions on today, there really isn't a whole lot of that. You know, it's almost as if this this signing day is going to become more of what's happened in the portal since yeah. the last signing day, yeah. right? I mean, uh, we, we're going to start watching more tape of guys that are already playing, have already played in college and are transferring into the Big Ten schools. So that, I think to me, that's the biggest difference. To me, you're absolutely right. You talk about the portal, and that's a big part of it. When you start to look at some of the teams that need to fill in depth, when need to fill in holes at certain positions, the transfer portal ends up being a place where they can go find the players that they may need 
elite that may be able to get that offense or that defense to the next stage. And I think that's what is really fascinating right now because in the first one, the first signing day, there are always teams that don't necessarily – fill their rosters for right. several reasons. And I think one of the big reasons now is the portal. And, and we're going to see some portal guys today on tape mm -hmm. actually play in college football. Right. And talk about a different evaluating. I mean, you know, we get all the college games because we use them during the season on, on our software. And, and to evaluate someone that's joining your program, already playing the game, playing it at a high level, I, I mean, there's no comparison between yep. evaluating that prospect and a high school prospect. And there are some real names that we'll get to in the portal. I mean, there's a guy who two years ago won the SEC co-freshman of the year, a quarterback yeah. from Missouri who's now going to Indiana. There's a quarterback who started <laughs> 10 games for Texas this past year who is transferring into the Big Ten right now. We're going to touch on that in just a little bit. We'll yeah, first round draft pick, win multiple national championships and be the best team leader and team player that I can be. I chose Ohio State because, you know, it's a brotherhood. All the coaches, all the players treat you like family here. All the students accept you for who you are, and it's a great campus and great history here, and I want to be a part of it. That's C.J. Hicks, the man who leads this group of Ohio State recruits. Top 20 player overall, regardless of position, number one guy in the state of Ohio. Underneath him, you see Sonny Styles. He's a five-star who was in the class of 2023. He reclassified to join the Buckeyes this year. A bunch of good names to keep an eye on, too. you got a quarterback there in Devin Brown and a handful of wide receivers, including Caleb Brown, who is actually with us in studio back on our first signing day. So that's, what, three full recruiting cycles and three top five nationally ranked classes for Ryan Day, who joins us now on the program. Ryan, how is signing day different for you now versus when it was your first year being the man in charge? Well, you know, that, that first year, it was um, making a transition with, with the staff and, and making sure that, you know, we were able to hang on to some guys because of the transition. And then, you know, in the second year, that was our first class uh, from beginning to end. And, and now, you know, we're able to get a couple years out on these guys and start these relationships. And it's, you know, really starts when they're freshmen. And then it kind of builds towards signing day. So uh, each year, you know, we become more and more, um, you know, th these relationships are just longer relationships. Well, you've had such great success bringing in wide receivers to Columbus. You look at the depth you showed in the Rose Bowl alone. Um, what do you look for when you're looking at a high school wide receiver? Well, first off, uh, you know, I think that, you know, we've done a really excellent job with, with the passing game and the quarterbacks. And so I think it's an exciting time right now to be a quarterback and be a wide receiver in this offense. Uh, but you got to give a lot of credit to Brian Hartline, the way that he's recruited and developed guys at the receiver position. I mean, it's everybody involved. But, uh, you know, it started when I first got here with Terry McLaurin and Paris Campbell and the guys who were here, and then it's kind of built from there. And, um, you know, these guys have really kind of left a legacy behind. And, you know, it was the same thing here with Chris Olave, you know, coming back deciding to come back for, for an extra year and then, you know, the year that Garrett had and then obviously as we have some of these young guys who are, who are stepping in. But, you know, we, we look for an extraordinary trait. You know, we look for guys who work hard. We want guys who have great attitudes, who want to be great, very highly competitive. But I, if you just ask me one thing that we're looking for on film, we're looking for some sort of extraordinary trait. Well, let's talk about some of those guys. Caleb Brown, Caleb Burden, Kyan Graves, Kojo Antwi, all K-sounding guys. Give me an example of what stands out about some of them. I think when you start with Kojo, just the explosiveness, his first step, his first five yards are just really powerful and explosive. You can see um, just the potential there. Um, I think with Keon Grays, you know, I, I would say if you had to compare him, what does he look like? Probably a young Chris Olave, um, you know, really quick and out of breaks, really good ball skills, great work ethic. Uh, Caleb Brown, kind of all around production. I think the best thing he does is play the game, um, just understands the game, spacing, how to set up. Um, you know, uh, defenders. And then I think Caleb Brown in the slot is, you know, he's got big legs and, and kind of, you know, more like Jackson where he can change direction quickly once the ball's in his hands. He's really powerful. Let me ask you about Sonny Styles. How do you handle things differently with him or anyone who reclassifies where they're coming to campus to be a college kid, but on a normal track, they'd only be doing their high school senior year this coming fall? Yeah, very unique situations, uh, and it's certainly something that, 
um, you know, the recruits bring to us and then ask our opinions on it, and, and we try to, to help them with that. But, but Sonny's a guy, you know, when, when he explained to us why he wanted to do it with his family, he had always played up. He just, he'd always played with the older guys. And so because of that, he wanted to get a head start. And so, you know, we decided he wanted to commit to us. The next conversation was we'd like to reclassify. And so, uh, you know, we went about the business of trying to help him with that. Uh, but this is a guy who's very versatile. Uh, he can do a lot of things. He's got a, you know, really uh, great personality. The recruits really flock to him and excited that he's a Buckeye. You got quarterback Devin Brown, who I believe in high school for a while, former Buckeye Joe Germain was his coach. What drew you to Devin? Uh, there's a lot of things there. He's a very good athlete. Um, you know, he plays basketball. He plays multiple sports. Uh, he's big. He can throw the ball um, and, and make all the throws. Uh, I, I really like his makeup. You know, he decided to come here with a pretty stacked quarterback room when he made the decision to, to come here. And he's just highly competitive. He wants to be great. And, um, you know, I, I think his personality already being on campus has, uh, has made an impact on some of our younger guys. You know, he got here a couple uh, you know, weeks ago. And so excited to see how he does this spring. You got the top player from Ohio, linebacker C.J. Hicks, who committed to you guys back when he was a sophomore. What do you remember about the first time you saw C.J. Hicks? Uh, you just see the talent. You know, it was, it was when he was young. This is, a, this is an example we were talking about before. We were able to get a head start on him. I think we started recruiting him as a freshman in Dayton at Alter. And, you know, he, he was just a, a great player. And he grew into his body. But you could tell he just had a feel for the game. Uh, the thing I, I would say about CJ is he's, the, he's, he's a leader. He's been a leader since he jumped on board. The minute he decided he wanted to be a Buckeye early on in the process, he helped us recruit just about everybody on this, uh, this, this class. And, you know, every, every year we try to identify early on in the process guys who can be leaders, who can help kind of put this class together. And CJ's done a great job of that. I, I'd be shocked if he's not a captain down the road for us. Back on the first signing day, you didn't have defensive lineman Hero Canoe. Why was he a priority for you? You know, anytime we, we, we in a recruiting class, defensive linemen are very, very important. And we need to continue to, to work on building up the interior of our defensive line. Uh, Hero is somebody that came to camp, very unique situation. Um, you know, grew up in Germany, went to school out in Santa Margarita Catholic in, in California, and uh, has a, a lot of upside because he hasn't played the game his whole life. Uh, just came over to the States here recently. And so we think that he has a chance to be uh, a really special player. Uh, what a great attitude, really uh, great family. Uh, you know, really grateful for everything that comes with this process and a unique situation because of his background coming overseas. But, uh, you know, we, th we think we have somebody really special here who uh, can help solidify our interior defensive line position. Because of the great success you've had since the moment you became a head coach, Ryan, the last few months there have been plenty of rumors about the NFL wanting to grab you. How do you choose to address those issues when recruits bring it up to you? Well, you know, I say it all the time, you know, in, in this profession, in this world right now, uh, if you're not winning, they're going to talk about replacing you. If you do well, they're going to talk about maybe you going somewhere else. So there's always going to be talk like that. Uh, you know, I love Ohio State. I love this place. My family loves it here. Uh, I tell recruits all the time, you know, if, if I was to go take another job, I'd be going by myself because my family's not leaving Columbus. <laughs> and that's the truth. They, they love it here. And, and we, we've, we've built, um, you know, in the last couple of years, some recruiting classes where we're very proud of our culture and, and guys like to be here. And we think that we've recruited really well. We have some really good talent. So the future is extremely bright here. We brought in great people. So, you know, this, this is the best place in the country to be the head, head football coach. So, you know, I, I love it here. And, and that's kind of the conversation that we have. Ryan Day, congrats on yet again another great recruiting class. Thanks for giving us some of your time. Oh, you got it. Thanks. Now, not everyone that they had, that they have now, did they have back on the first signing day. Here's an example of one, Omari Abor from Texas. He's a linebacker, defensive lineman guy, top 10 player from that talent-rich state, top 100 ranked player overall. There's a lot to get to. We could break down a ton of guys that are <laughs> almost all five and four star <laughs> talent. But before we do that, kind of big picture, I mean, here we are again. 
This is like a decade straight of Ohio State just dominating in the world of recruiting. And yet everybody has needs, even Ohio State, right? I mean, I think if you looked at their roster, they would say we have to get better on defense. So of the 21 guys that they signed before today, the two five stars, and you've already mentioned them, Hicks and Styles, their defense, right? Hicks is linebacker, Styles is a safety. They also signed three edge rushes, which is a new position that our recruiting folks have, have started to invent. Two corners, a defensive lineman. So really, it, it's a class that, has addressed some needs, regardless of how good you are, including Ohio State, you have needs, and they obviously made an effort to, to help their defense, which they need to do. Also help themselves along the offensive line, and they did that just shortly after we got off the air in the first signing day. They battle it through for offensive lineman Carson Hidsman, who's from the state of Wisconsin. You don't see ooh, offensive linemen from Wisconsin leave Wisconsin a whole lot. And so he took this recruitment out. It was a real battle between the Badgers and Ohio State. They get Carson in the class, really physical player. You heard Coach Day mention multi-sport guys. This guy's a four-sport athlete. He wrestled, uh, played basketball, was on the track and field team. I think he's going to end up playing center. That's a position they've done well at with guys like Josh Myers and Billy Price. I think he's the next one in that line. It's center, not a position we invented by the way <laughs> you know one of the interesting things is he also talked about when he talked about Caleb is a guy that just understands the game of football and he is one of these players that really could play all over the field and to be able to have him now in the fold I think is going to give this program a lot of versatility of what he's able to do as far as being able to run uh, run the routes be able to help you in the special teams game line up at running back if you want to stick him in the slot He's a very talented guy, high football IQ, and I think this guy is going to have an opportunity to really be able to contribute early in his career. The, I mentioned in the interview the amount of wide receiver talent he's brought in the last few years. I mean, like three or four guys every year that are the top 20 wide receivers available in the country. And big picture, last one on Ohio State, seven of the last nine years. They've had a <laughs> top five ranked class nationally, which is amazing. Do rankings mean anything, Mike? They, they do mean something. <laughs> Ohio State does seem to win an awful lot with these guys. Well, here's a look at the highest ranked signee for each Big Ten school. These are names you got a great chance of hearing for the next handful of years in the Big Ten. And if you look in the middle on the left, you've got a guy named Desan McCullough. He is a big deal for the Indiana Hoosiers to the point that he's the highest ranked player to go to Indiana in the modern era. We chatted with him on campus. I picked Indiana because it's a hometown to me. I grew up here. I really like what Coach Allen's doing with the program and how he's building it. Uh, the chance to play with my older brother is just something that you can't turn down that chance. Once in a lifetime opportunity. And I'm just really excited to get to work with the team and the players. And I just love everything about this place. Well, here's a look at the Indiana recruits, and, and there's a, a lot of interesting nuggets about McCullough, top 100 player in the country, was at one point committed to Ohio State, decommitted from them. You got Travell Mullen from Florida. That guy's the seventh highest ranked player to Indiana in the modern era. If you add Jabron Payne and Dominic James, that's four guys who are among the 12 highest ranked recruits ever to go to Indiana. Um, it's impressive stuff, and here's Tom Allen explaining why the class was so good to us back on the first signing day. We started building this group throughout the fall, and to all the different things that we were working through as a staff, you know, we just felt like that it could be a really special group, and, and I know that these guys believed in what we're doing here. It was neat to see them be rewarded for that by being able to sign with us, but uh, definitely a lot of hard work by our coaches, a lot of relationships being built over time, and just them seeing that... Uh, uh, we have a program here that they want to be a part of, so it's very exciting. What we were able to do in 2020 uh, was just huge for these guys to see what we can become here at Indiana and be able to, to show them on that field uh, that they can be able to do great things and, and do things that are historic, things that haven't happened here in a long, long time. And so e even through the challenges of this year, and good guys, they stayed with us. They believe in the foundation that we've laid. They believe in the culture we've built here. And these guys saw that they wanted to be part of it. And it's a special, special thing. So I really appreciate them believing in us and want to be Hoosiers. An Indiana class is traditionally in the mid-50s. This one is number 21. Here's a smaller way to look at it. In 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20, they had four four-star players. They have five 
four-star players in this class alone? This is an extraordinary recruiting class, recruiting job by Tom Allen and the staff. I mean, they're 21st in the country, which you mentioned, Mike. They're fourth in the East, right, behind, between, behind Ohio State, Michigan, and Penn State. And, and here's why it's extraordinary. What's the narrative about Indiana? Oh, you won nine games a couple years ago. You won two games this year. And the only reason you may have had some success is because of Michael Penix. And this proves that that is not true. I mean, think about all 14 schools. Very few schools have automatic recruiting bases like Ohio State and Michigan and Penn State and Michigan State to a certain extent. Most are fighting for their lives in recruiting, right? And for Tom Allen, after winning two games, to have the 21st class, the fourth in the East, it's extraordinary work. This is how... You build a program like Indiana and stay ahead of all the programs that are li- like yours. You do it on signing day. Yeah. Re- recruiting rankings matter for the national champion contenders, and they matter a lot for Indiana. And you also heard Coach really giving praise to a lot of his assistant coaches because they do an unbelievable job of going out and making some of those relationships. And this Dominic James from IMG is a player just like that. Kevin Wright, who is the tight end coach there, was the former head coach there at IMG. But this is a player that really jumps off off the screen. We have an opportunity to watch him inside, being able to be strong at the point of attack. Plays high at some points, but continues to have a, a motor that's going to allow him to continue to make uh, strides at this level. I think he's a guy that's going to be ready to go and compete right away because one of the things that you do at IMG and you learn really quickly is how to work off the field and in the weight room. So he's going to understand what it's going to take to be a part of this defensive line and be able to play early. They went down to Texas in this class and picked up a quarterback, Brendan Soresby, in the high school ranks. But they also added another talent to the quarterback room in Connor Bazelak, who is one of these transfers that we said we were going to talk about at the start of the show. Adding immediate experience to that quarterback room, a guy who has started many games in the SEC, has played in some tight games, uh, overtime game against Florida last year. So in clutch situations, he's played and performed. He's a Midwest guy, so used to kind of the Big Ten weather that he's going to see. You know, when we were sitting here last year, one of the guys that we were talking about in their class primarily was Donovan McCulley. He kind of got thrown into the fire a little bit early. Now you add experience in Connor Bazelak. He's going to compete with McCulley and Jack Tuttle and some of those other guys they have coming back at the quarterback position. I mean, he was the future of the Missouri football program. It, you know how much talent you have to have to be the SEC yep. co-freshman of the year? And that's what he was just two years ago. And now he's heading to Tom Allen and the Hoosiers. Let's turn to another team in this state, the Purdue Boilermakers. And speaking of quarterbacks, how about their top-ranked recruit, Brady Allen of the Boilermakers. Now he's Indiana's Mr. Football, the first time a Mr. Football from the state of Indiana went to Purdue since 2014 when it was Markel Jones. Nick Carraway comes to them from Texas. Joe Strickland, another in-state kid as well, actually played against Brady Allen in the state title game this year. Let's hear from the quarterback recruit. What I want to accomplish at Purdue um, is, you know, taking us to getting us to that high level again of, you know, getting back in the Big Ten championship, going to the Rose Bowl, you know, hopefully, you know, making that step into the college football playoff, too. Um, You know, I don't think there's any time, any better time to be a Boilermaker. And, you know, I think things are rolling right now. Um, And, you know, being that being that next quarterback in the cradle also um, is, you know, huge, huge honor and, uh, you know, something not taken taken for granted around here or taken lightly. So, you know, I would say those are two of the main things, a couple of the main things that, you know, I really hope to accomplish here at Purdue. School is known as the cradle of QBs, but how about this? (laughs) Allen is the second highest ranked recruit to go to the Boilermakers this millennium. Only Kyle Orton ahead of him. And Orton, of course, went on to have a long career in the NFL. Here's the head coach, Jeff Brom, on Brady Allen. Brady is a, a tremendous talent, gives you a prototypical size, he's got a great arm, really is a better athlete than you think, extremely smart, bright. We've recruited him for a long time. He's wanted to come to Purdue. He wants to make a difference for an in-state program. He's been able to recruit very well and help us along the way after he committed. Had a tremendous senior year, won the state championship, threw for a lot of yards. So we're excited to get him every opportunity to go out there and compete and and, uh, prove his worth early on. But uh, fortunately for us, we got a good quarterback room, but he'll be able to come in and compete right away. We feel like we got a couple difference makers in this class, surrounded by other, a lot of really other good players that will be uh, productive for us and have a great career, but excited because we feel like we've addressed quite a few of the needs uh, and a lot of these guys we think can be really outstanding players for our program. 
If only Jeff Brom had a history of high-powered offense that could use <laughs> a talented quarterback like him. Yeah, and he knows a thing or two about playing the quarterback position as well, right? And Brady Allen was a guy that they really identified early in the process. He's been getting recruited since his freshman year, four-year starter at the high school level, threw for a bunch of yards. And I think what really stands out about him, too, when we look at him, is that uh, you, you watch him on tape, this kind of looks like Purdue's offense, the wide-open <laughs> nature of his high school offense. But when we saw him in several camps throwing alongside other top quarterback recruits, you could make the argument that he had the best arm of any player there. Certainly was one of the best at several of those events. He can really throw the football. He's got the size to come in and compete right away, and he's a guy that Jeff Brom identified as the quarterback they wanted in this class. You know, Alan, there's no accident that it's a similar offense to Purdue. I mean, Purdue, Indiana, most state schools do a great job of welcoming high school staffs on, on campus, and they probably have put in some of the, the concepts. But what a bounce back year. A year ago, they were 76 in the country. They're 37 today. And, and, you know, a few years back, the four of us sat here, and we talked about how the West really improved their recruiting. You had some young coaches, Scott Frost. You had P.J. Fleck. You had Jeff Brom coming into the West and really improving all three schools. Well, other than last year when Jeff fell back to 76, he's really come out of the pack of those three, and that's going to help him, obviously, on the field because we were really excited about the improved recruiting in the West. You know, other than, like, like I say, other than last year, Jeff has held us to that. Yeah, Tyrone Tracy is a wide receiver that was at Iowa. They really had a, um, a really good year, I should say, when he was at Iowa. Would you talk about having a player that's played the game, played it at a high level, understands what he needs to be able to do. And listen, if you're a wide receiver, this is a place you want to play. <laughs> I mean, that's the reality of it. Talk about catching a lot of footballs, and you'll have that opportunity. But he'll be he'll address an immediate need for them. They play a lot, a lot of wide receivers. They've got some good young talent that is coming up that had to step up last year. And he's going to be a player that's going to be able to add to that depth right now for the team. The quarterback this year for the Boilermakers, Aiden O'Connell, threw for almost 300 yards a game, top three in the country in completion percentage. He was an unranked recruit. That's going to make Boilermaker, Boilermaker fans drool about what they can do with a guy with this much talent at the high school level. In 2018, Penn State had the number six ranked class in the country. That was the best they've ever done. This year, they have tied that mark. An excellent run with some elite talents. Denied Dennis Sutton, the defensive lineman, number one player from the state of Maryland. Nicholas Singleton, top player from the state of Pennsylvania. Drew Alar, we think that's how you say it. He is a top five quarterback in the country. Caden Saunders, a top five player from the state of Ohio, top 10 wide receiver in the country. This class is stacked. Yeah, no matter how you quantify it, this is an incredible class for James Franklin, who's good enough to join us now in the modern era. Rankings-wise, it's the best Penn State has ever brought in. When during the last year or so, James, did it hit you of, oh, we're assembling something pretty special here? Yeah, I think obviously getting out of the, the COVID uh, circumstance and getting back into more of a traditional uh, recruiting calendar helped. Um, and then it was a, a strong year in the region and in the state. So that, that played a part in it as well. The staff did a great job and, you know, kind of the dominoes and the pieces just kind of, you know, kept coming together and, and we were able to you know, continue to build. So I, I'm super proud of the class. I'm super proud of the staff and what we've been able to do. You know, now it's about consistently. We got to we got to do this year in and year out um, to go where we want to go. Well, let's talk about some of those guys. Defensive lineman denied Dennis Sutton. Alabama wanted him, didn't get him. Georgia wanted him, didn't get him. You wanted him and got him. Why was he so desirable? Well, he's extremely mature. Uh, comes from a great high school program. Coach Soule does a great job over there at McDonough. Uh, Coach Soule actually played for me at the University of Maryland. We go way back. Um, we've signed a number of players from this high school, and I think that helped. I think there was a comfort level there. But he's just unusually uh, mature uh, emotionally, but he's also unusually mature physically as well. You're talking about a guy who's six foot five, anywhere between 255 and 60 pounds, and can run. So, you know, he's he's an unusual guy from the standpoint at defensive end. I think he's going to have a chance to come in and compete right away. And a lot of times you you, you say that, but you're not sure if it's necessarily going to play out that way. And and as this guy continues to to thrive in his senior year as well as in All Star games. I think he's going to have a chance to be able to come in and compete uh, on the defensive line, which is hard to do. 
Running back Nicholas Singleton is worth discussing. He wins the National Gatorade High School Player of the Year. What do you see in him that maybe the tape of his highlights doesn't show? You know, great family. Uh, both mom and dad, you know, were phenomenal through this entire process. You know, the high school as well, Governor Mifflin, we got, we got history there. Uh, but you're just talking about a guy, again, you know, from a physically mature standpoint, uh, big, strong, fast, powerful, productive. Obviously, we got a pretty good history at Penn State at the running back position. <laughs> I think that helped us. And then he really has handled all of this, you know, extremely well. Um, you know, you're talking about both those guys, five-star guys, that it never really got to their head. They're, they stayed grounded. Uh, their families were a big part of that. Their high school coaches were a big part of that. But again, now the difference with him is he is on campus. He's already here, um, and he's already kind of opening eyes on campus to players. There's a buzz about him with our, our players. Uh, there's a buzz about him with our strength staff and our coaches. Um, he's doing crazy things in the weight room and the same thing, you know, in terms of our, our baseline testing when they arrive. So a lot of excitement about him. You're a Franklin Simple, clean last name. I'm a Hall, easy, no confusion. But is it Aller, Aller, Alar? Help me out with your new QB. You're, you're putting me on the spot because we have the same discussions in the <laughs> office. Uh, I, th I, think, I think it's Alar. And, um, you know, but we've gone, we've gone back and forth. There's sometimes I think I'm right and then I go back the other way. Um, but yeah, you know, you're talking about, you know, a, a special young man. And, and to me, kind of what I really still love about the recruiting process, you know, early on when we offered him, when, when Coach Yersich got here, you know, he was well thought of and had a bunch of offers. But um, as a guy that just steadily rose up the rankings based on what he did at camps and combines, but then what he did as a senior, um, you know, had a huge year, uh, ends up, you know, depending on which site you look at, the number one ranked quarterback uh, in the country. He's on campus already. Um, he's big. He's strong. He's more athletic than people give him credit for. And, and he can whip the ball all over the field and has been a great decision maker. So, you know, there's a lot of excitement about him in our program as well. Um, you know, obviously, they're the three big names. There's, there's a bunch of guys that we can talk about, but these, these are the guys you're specifically talking about. And there's a lot of buzz and, and it's warranted. What about Caden Saunders, the wide receiver? What kind of talent does he have? Yeah, Caden's a guy, you know, that, that jumped on the scene very early on. Um, you know, we were able to get involved with him and his family early in the process. You know, tremendous quickness, tremendous speed, body control, and confidence. Um, you know, did it last year and then came to our camp and, and really was impressive in a live performance in camp. Um, another guy that's on campus right now. You know, he's a little bit undersized, and, and some programs, um, they're not, you know, interested in undersized wideouts. We've had a lot of success with guys like K.J. Hamler and now Parker Washington. So, um, you know, we think we, we got a really good opportunity to, to take advantage of Caden's strengths. We've had a history of using similar type guys in the past. Um, but he's on campus and, and has already you know, got people excited about him and what he's going to need to do. So um, we talk about a guy that could be a playmaker as a punt returner as well as a, as a receiver in our system. Finish the sentence for me. James Franklin's philosophy when it comes to the transfer portal is? Uh, being open-minded and, and flexible. You know, um, you know I, I think the transfer portal is something you better embrace. You better embrace it as a football program. You better embrace it as an administration and as a university um, because there's opportunities to be able to, you know, uh, solve some problems. And it's probably, you know, maybe one of the best times in, in the history of college football to take over a program because you have more resources and, and more ways to, to solve problems than ever before. Um, so, so we're going to embrace it like we, like we will anything else. Uh, that's a new rule. Uh, and make sure that we're putting Penn State in the best position to be successful. James, before we let you go, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, Happy birthday, sir! What are the plans for Big 5-0? Well, you know, you know you were born to be a college football coach when your birthday's on signing day. I got a little worried when they went to early signing period. I thought, you know, maybe taking the, the shine away a little bit. But, uh, but yeah, just spend time with the family. Obviously, you know, with, with recruiting being over, it, it really helps. 
uh, to be able to spend some time with the family. We've been on the road ripping and running all over the place. So my wife and my two daughters, um, they'll get they'll get a full dose of dad uh, for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then we'll be back to work on Monday. That sounds about exactly what I thought you would say. A little bit of family time and right back to work. James, congrats on the great class. And thanks so much for your time, as always. Thanks, Mike. You as well, buddy. I mean, there was room for him to invite me to a summer. <laughs> that was not you had a chance. chance. That's fine. Uh, Drew Alar, we're pretty sure, at least for now, Amori, uh, is right up there with the highest ranked quarterback recruits to go to Penn State in the modern era. And you see some of those names out there turned out to be pretty darn good. But what about the guys he's going to be involved with on offense? I mean, if I was a Penn State fan there and I heard him talk about Caden Saunders in the same breath as K.J. <laughs> Hamler, that would get me pretty excited. Yeah, we talk a lot about Drew, and he gets rightly a lot of the attention, but he has to have some guys to throw the football to. And I promise you, I already had in my notes here to say that Caden Saunders was very similar to K.J. Hamler <laughs> and Parker Washington, but I can't say it any better than Coach Franklin. So I guess I'll Let find me see something else. Let me see it. Talk. Oh, it okay. says it right there. All right, yeah. <laughs> But they had a receiver in high school. They have some really, really good pieces at the skill position. So Drew Alar, big part of the class, but he has some weapons coming Yeah, up. Nicholas Singleton, the running back. You heard Coach Franklin talk about him, how big and physical he is. To me, he's a really unique talent because he's so big and powerful. I think he can give some immediate help, but they're going to have to be able to, to fix that running game and that offensive line up front because this kid can do it all. He doesn't necessarily, you don't want to see a lot of him catching the ball, but he does a great job, I think, of using his hands. He also returned punts in high school. Shows you how explosive he is. J.B. Nelson, the second highest ranked junior college prospect this year. Offensive tackle, which is an area that Penn State can improve on. You can see here he's got great flexibility. What I love about him is he's never on the ground. You know, offensive linemen don't need pants. I mean football pants. Okay. <laughs> and he, he's a guy that proves that. You can play the game, the entire game on your feet. You can see him here. He, he bends at the knees. He's got great flexibility. He, he's, he's got a lot of talent. And again, he's an older guy that can mm -hmm. come in. And you don't recruit a junior college offensive lineman if you don't expect them to play. Right, and like you said, they need that. That they could need. be a big help for them right away. A quick note on the guy you talked about, Singleton, a national Gatorade Player of the Year. Here's some other guys who won that award. Uh, Peyton Manning, <laughs> Kyler Murray, Emmett Smith. Just saying, that's a pretty good group to be involved in. You look at the recruiting map for Penn State, and they do indeed focus on that area, but they're not afraid to go wherever they need to. Southeast, south, all the way in the northwest to Washington. Meanwhile, the Rutgers Scarlet Knights focus an awful lot on the state of New Jersey and with good reason. They had a great class. Before Shiano came in, their last two classes were ranked in the 60s. This one is in the top 30 nationally, headlined by guys like Moses Walker, who comes from Brooklyn, Jacob Allen from New Jersey, Anthony Johnson from Philly. A lot of guys from in that specific area that they want to be in for Rutgers. Here's what Greg Shiano had to say about all that. The first two years here, you know, we took the job and then a worldwide pandemic hit. So we were recruiting over WebEx and, and Zoom. And now to be able to actually have a traditional class that we recruited and, you know, a really, a really fine class and one we're really happy with. You know, this isn't anything that we weren't doing the last time we were here. You know, when we left in 2011, had we stayed, that class would have been a top five class. So this has been done before. It just hasn't been done lately, and uh, I think with the Big Ten Conference behind us now, uh, this this needs to be a regular occurrence. And I think people are seeing us differently. We just need to keep building upon it, and it really is all of our duty to do better. We have to do better as coaches, the players, our fans. We're building. I think it's great. You know, I think people are seeing the, the fan excitement and the involvement, but every bit of our program has to continue to grow, and this is a big step. So we do show you that map to see how focused Shiano has been. Eight guys from New Jersey, one from Maryland, three from Pennsylvania. That section they want to lock down so desperately, and they have done it. Uh, they got a lot of guys from in-state, but they just got a lot of talented guys in general. As many four-star players in this group as they had the last four classes 
combined, including a headliner in Jacob Allen. Yeah, he's one of those in-state guys you mentioned, and he was an in-state guy that schools came from out of state to try to recruit and pull him away from Rutgers. They did a really good job recruiting him at 28 offers. Schools like Alabama, Penn State, Notre Dame, Michigan, a lot of different schools came in to recruit him. They got him committed last May, which hmm. was huge in the building of this class. We talked a lot about skill guys on this show, but Big Ten is still a conference where games are won and lost up front. This guy could be a cornerstone type left tackle if he turns out to be uh, what the evaluators think he is. Six foot six, 270 pounds, and a left tackle type body and athleticism for the Scarlet Knights. You know, we've mentioned that they signed the eight prospects in, in New Jersey, but they also lost some. And the reason I say that is what a job of an in-state recruiter is, is to make sure that you do a better job of recruiting everybody in-state than anybody else. Now, you may not get all of them. If you get eight, you know, maybe you wish you had nine. But what's changed about Rutgers, because Greg Schiano did this last time he was there, what's changed now is the portal. So if you have that much talent in-state, you're never going to get all of it. But what's going to happen to you if someone leaves the state and you did a great job recruiting them they now can come back which they have in the past but now they can come back and be eligible immediately so you know there's an old saying how you hated to come in second on the prospect <laughs> you'd rather come in third because you spend so much time on coming in second that you you may have to drop down to your fourth choice now coming in second at in new jersey for rutgers you might see that player come back to you if, if he doesn't like his experience where he went. And I think that's important as far as the coaching staff is concerned to be able to continue to build those relationships and not burn those bridges. And that's what they've been able to do when you look at what they've done in the transfer portal. They've immediately gotten much better at the wide receiver position. You talk about the physical stature of some of the guys that they're now able to bring in. That's going to be immediate help for a team that when they throw the ball around and they can have some success on the perimeter, that opens up that running game. So the portal is always going to be important to Rutgers, but as you mentioned, they're not going to get everybody, but you might get them the second time around. You know, the portal rules are the same for everybody, but it just impacts everybody a little different right. way. And like James Franklin said, you better embrace it. And among those recruits from Jersey, it's not just getting kids. They're getting good kids. Yeah, right. Three of the top ten ranked kids in the state of New Jersey, which has a lot of talent, are going to Rutgers. That's as many as the last four classes for Rutgers combined. Well, the Iowa Hawkeyes look like a Hey, look at the last four classes, the top recruits. What position was that, Howard? Yep. Offensive <laughs> line. They do that pretty well there in Madison. And the guy who headlines it this year is Joe Brunner, and he is here. He's not small. You can understand why Wisconsin wanted him. Thanks so much for coming to the show for this. Um, when did you know for sure you wanted to go to Wisconsin? Um, I think it was after I took that first official visit. Um, you know, I haven't been anywhere in about a year due to COVID, um, but I got there, I got around the guys, the town, um, and I fell in love instantly. What was it that you fell in love with? I think, you know, it was, it was the way that the guys on the team in that old line room really treated me. Um, they treated me like I was already on the team, like I was already a brother, um, and I loved that. Your high school coach said you had feet like a ballerina. <laughs> what did he mean by that? I got quick feet, I got light feet. Um, I'm a big guy, um, and to be good at the O-line position, you have to be quick on your feet. Um, can't be heavy, can't yeah. be slow. Um, and, you know, kind of sixth grade, I started to be really big, and my dad said, you know, in order to take it to the next level, you gotta be fast, so don't get too big, right. or else you'll, you know. But you never took any dance classes or anything, no, did you? No, 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 no. Because no, no. I asked Paul Chris about that on their first signing day, he goes, doesn't look like a ballerina <laughs> to me. No. Joe, we've been doing this show for 15 years, and we really get into recruiting, but this year is different for us. Mm -hmm. And one thing we don't know a lot about is when the coaches are recruiting you, what do they say about the transfer portal, and what do they say about the NIL? Take us inside a meeting with a coach. Right. Um, you know, when you're talking to a coach about the transfer portal, really, um, it's packed. Um, there's a lot of guys in there, but they don't really go in depth about it. Um, unless you were to ask them a question. So I've never really had a deep conversation about the transfer portal with um, Coach Christ or um, my offensive line coach. But I know uh, my brother was in that portal, so I know it's, it's a lot of guys and it. it's a tough time, but it's, it's important too to teams. Um, and then NIL, um, you know, they, they try and sell um, stuff around on campus, things that can get you popular, um, and social media. Social media is probably the biggest thing. 
Um, nowadays, you can put your name out there and get uh, very popular. Um, so they try and sell that as best they can. You mentioned your, your coach. Tell me how important your position coach was in your decision. Um, Rudolph, who is gone now, right. obviously, uh, he was huge. Uh, I loved him. He was a great guy. Um, I would talk to him probably every week, a couple times a week. Um, and he really he helped me fall in love with the School of Madison um, and the guys on that team. But um, obviously, like I said, my brother, who was in college, played mm -hmm. football. Um, I learned to not fall in love with the coach, but the atmosphere, the team, um, the guys within the program. And so when Rudolph left, um, I was able to accept that. It's a business. Um, and I know that... Uh, you know, it's the next guy coming in, and I, I have faith. Same question about the head coach. How important was the head coach? Um, I would say it's the same thing. Um, I'm not going to be around him as much as I was, uh, Rudolph, but he's a great guy. He's the best coach I've talked to um, out of all the college coaches, I would say. Nicest guy, very genuine, um, and he, I, I love him for sure. You thought about what it's going to be like blocking for Braylon Allen? Oh, of course, of <laughs> course. I, probably every day I think about it. Yeah? For sure. What's oh it going to be God. like? Amazing. Probably the best experience I've ever had. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, gosh. What do you like about his game? He is, for how big he is, um, he's very aggressive. Um, he's young, but I think as he gets older and as he matures, the vision will become greater and mm -hmm. become better, and that will make him even better of a football player. Um, but for his size at that age, um, it's, it's incredible. He's so explosive. Um, just a large human being for a running back. Last one for you. In, in doing some research, I found, tell me if it's true, you can throw a tight spiral 60 yards? I can, yes. Okay. Tight. Have we talked to Paul about quarterback? Because nobody's bringing you down. If you've got a little bit of accuracy. No, not at all. I've tried. Um, I don't think it's going to go anywhere. Yeah. But Well, listen, hopefully. Braylon was recruited as a linebacker. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Just saying. Just saying. Just saying. Joe, thanks for being here, man. Thank it was you. fun to talk to you, and good luck the next handful of years in Madison. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, let's take a look at the class overall that they are bringing in. Again, Joe is their top-ranked recruit, a uh, top 100 player nationally, but they got some really impressive guys coming in on the defensive side as well. Alan, when you look at this class, what stands out to you? Well, I think in the defensive uh, secondary as well as the front seven, they're bringing in a lot of athleticism. Here's a guy who did play some quarterback in high school in Austin Brown that's going to convert into another position. Really, really good athlete. Played a little bit smaller school competition in Illinois, but garnered a lot of offers and uh, went to some camps and did really well at those. And Wisconsin's done really well with these kind of guys. Zach Bond was a high school quarterback. Scotty Nelson was a high school quarterback. They seem to always find the right way to use these guys and find the right fit for them. Austin Brown's a guy who can play all over that defense. Keontae Lewis is a transfer in. He's went originally from East St. Louis, so it's a team that a program, a young man that uh, they've had some really contact with, but he's a player that I think can come in and help you right away as far as being a player to be able to make plays. They need to get more explosive on the outside, and with his frame of 6'3", just under 200 pounds, he gives them that ability. I think someone that can help them right away. You look at the Big Ten West Division rankings, the amount of commits each class is bringing in, and their national ranking there. The Badgers are right in the middle. They do have a lesser amount of commits than anybody else. And up at the top, you see the Iowa Hawkeyes. Iowa is there sitting pretty with a class that did not look that way, but is right now in the top 30 nationally. They got a superstar in-state safety named Xavier Nwankpa. Here's Xavier. My choice to go to Iowa was just like the DB production, like the culture here, and a chance to do something special. Starting the grind here, getting to know the team, like the playbooks, I'll become the best version of myself, and just help the team in any way I can. You look at the top 10 overall Big Ten recruits, a lot of Ohio State, a lot of Penn State, a lot of Michigan, but yes, there's Nwankpa for Iowa, one of the 10 best players coming into the league, a big get for Kirk Ferentz. A lot of times with prospects, you have to watch their tape for a while. Uh, some players just jump out immediately at you, and uh, he certainly did that. That's a little bit unusual for a defensive back. Um, you know, sometimes they're not as involved in the play, but uh, he's just one of those guys that makes plays, uh, shows up an awful lot. I uh, got a chance to see the first half of a game uh, the night before our Penn State ball game and had to leave at uh, halftime, but uh, he ended up blocking the 
the attempt for the winning field goal. <laughs> and uh, it just has a knack of you know making the big play. You know, I think overall we're pleased with our efforts. Uh, you know, we're probably not done totally at this point. You know, like a lot of teams, but uh, it's going to be interesting moving forward. But we feel really good about the guys that signed on with us. Just a really good crew group of guys. Here's a look at some of the top guys besides Nwankpa. Aaron Graves, a big get, number two player in the state of Iowa. He committed to the Hawkeyes a month after finishing his freshman year. Kirk called, offered a scholarship. He said, how do I commit to make it official? Because he knew he wanted to be an Iowa Hawkeye. Howard, you know, back in early December, as like our prep for our first signing day show started to heat up, this did not look like a great class Good. for Iowa. But they closed strong, added Nuangpa, added five guys on the first <laughs> signing day back in mid-December. Yeah. And sure enough, they're the top group of all the Big Ten West. Teams. I think it really speaks to the, val the valuation process. And I think sometimes, you know, we look at the programs and we say, okay, they want to be done after that first signing period, have the majority of those players signed and uh, on campus if they decide to early enroll. But this Iowa program, they take their time and they want to make sure that they have the guys that they need that are going to best fit their program. And I think that's what you saw in this second signing uh, period, that they continued to go out and evaluate the players that were out there, and they actually picked up an unbelievable player that's going to help them immediately, but also other players that are going to be able to fit in and fill some holes and some needs that they're going to need. Yeah, Xavier Nwankpa is a no-doubt bell cow headliner of this class, but I think when you talk about Iowa, there's always going to be somebody later in that class that they find, somebody towards the bottom of the rankings, even a walk-on maybe that ends up being a really good player for them. We don't, I don't know that we talked about TJ Hawkinson and those kind of guys on this show, so I picked one of those guys, <laughs> Landon Van Kiekerix, who wasn't on the radar at all going into his senior year and for most of his senior year, um, was, was a little bit of a late bloomer, then has this huge senior year, scored 33 touchdowns on offense at 76 tackles on defense. He's going to play linebacker for them, I think. Needs to add weight, but this is the perfect program for him to go to and do that. This is an Iowa special kind of guy. Somebody who they slid under the radar, signed late, and I think he's going to turn out to be a good player. You know, I don't know the backstory with Jazz Patterson. I, I just think he's one of the better players in the in the conference to, to sign this year. At first play, you could see him burst off his foot. This is a play that... Uh, shows his acceleration through the end zone. He's perfect for the Iowa offense. They're an I formation team or a tailback formation team. He's really going to be valuable. I, I'll be surprised if he gets an opportunity he won't play right away as a freshman. Something interesting on this group, no transfers for Iowa. They are the only team in the Big Ten that did not pick someone up at this point through the transfer portal. Martinez sets up deep in the pocket, guns it, and caught! Torrey! Can he get dead? Samari Torrey! Touchdown, Cornhuskers! Samari Torrey, he's the transfer. He dress and he's sacked! And that's Abacady transfer from Temple. We're into hour number two of our coverage of the second signing day in the class of 2022. Howard Griffith, Jared Nardo, Alan True, and Mike Hall here with you. You just saw a bunch of players who made big impacts in the Big Ten last year that were transfers. Of course, of course, none bigger than Kenneth Walker, who was the bell cow for Michigan State, part of their 11-win season. Let's take a look at the top 50 transfer rankings in terms of classes. And right now, Nebraska and Michigan State are in the top 10. This is just based on kids that they are getting from the transfer portal. But Indiana also has double digit commits in there. Minnesota, Rutgers, Wisconsin, and Purdue. These are all groups in the top 50 nationally. Um, give me an idea on how your site 24 seven has chosen to address ranking these transfers. Because we've seen whether it was Walker, Abikati, like. You get a transfer, it could be a huge instant impact for your team. Yeah, it's been kind of a quick work in progress the last two years. Starting last year, we ranked transfers individually. They did not figure into the team rankings. But then this year, we have a way where you can toggle it now, where it's just the recruiting rankings if you take just the high school recruits and the junior college recruits. But you can also now look at a blend of the rankings to see where a class would rank if you count their transfer rankings in. And we did that because 
I think it's a fair way to look at a class because some schools don't use all of their scholarships on high school kids. It, it is a more fair way to see how each school has used their allotment of scholarships. Some schools are choosing to use that more in the portal and signing less high school kids. Being able to toggle that to an overall rank now allows the fans to see how that all fits together. Yeah, it absolutely should be part of the rankings. I, I think the interesting thing, Alan, for you and your group, how, how you evaluate the talent. I, I can remember watching Kenneth Walker on Wake Forest video last year, and I was really impressed with him because I did the Michigan State Spring game. I didn't think he was going to be a Heisman <laughs> Trophy candidate, but you knew he was a good player. But as I watched him, I, I wasn't comparing him to high school players, right? So I, I think the evaluation is going to be really uh, significant. We're going to see a couple guys that are transferring in the conference here in a little bit and we're going to watch them actually play in college football so when you're recruiting a high school prospect he wants to know how soon can I play what position can I play what's the offense going to look like especially if you just took over a program now when you go out and recruit someone in the transfer portal they know what your offense looks like they know your depth they know a lot more about you and you know a lot more about them it's a I think it's a really smooth transition yeah for the ones that are embracing it right you heard coach Franklin talk about you better embrace it not only as a coaching staff but also as an institution right because some people have issues with trying to go out and bring other transfers in that aren't grad transfers but to me this is just a, another opportunity for coaches and programs that are trying to jumpstart what they're trying to do because as you mentioned you now have the evaluation of a player competing against other college players and you know what that talent gap is or is it so I think it's going to just going to continue to help programs continue to build depth the challenge will always be the balancing act between going out and getting those transfer portal guys versus the guys you're bringing in and trying to develop and think about the campus visit I mean, someone that you may be competing for a starting position may be your host. You now sit down with your position coach, and if you're a wide receiver and you've been coached by some great position coach at the previous place, you're measuring that position coach against your previous experience. I mean, it's almost night and day type of recruiting. And again, it's, it's, it's the next level of junior college recruiting in my mind. Well, where it's been difficult for us to maybe evaluate a transfer, you talk about having that college tape. Well, sometimes there's a guy who was a hot shot recruit in high school who hasn't played at the college yeah. level yet. How do you evaluate that guy? And I'm sure it's the same challenge for the colleges. And again, let's not forget, less high school players are getting scholarships because of this. Right. And, and that, 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 that impacts a lot of young people. And something I find interesting is, what about that case? The guy who's the, uh, the Jameson Williams at Ohio State who can't crack the lineup, but he goes to Alabama and is able to start right away versus somebody who's crushing it at a smaller school and wants a chance to get a step up. Do coaches lean one way or another? Someone they think looked better on tape as a high schooler or someone who's played better against lesser college competition? There's, there's a lot of different angles to it. And you're probably sitting there going, well, who is the next Kenneth Walker? Who is the next Arnold Ebicady? Well, here's what it looks like in terms of the transfer rankings. These are the 10 highest ranked guys that are coming in to the Big Ten. Jay Shaw, the cornerback for the Badgers, comes from UCLA. Victor Oluwatimi, the offensive lineman for Michigan, coming from Virginia. You see a few other schools here at the bottom. You notice Jalen Berger, that's from the Big Ten. He was at Wisconsin, of course, as the running back and is now with the Spartans. Let's turn our attention over to the Nebraska Cornhuskers, who have had their fair share of transfers, double digits for them. But as for their recruits, Jaden Gold is a top 200 player in the country, the number two player from the state of New Jersey. DeColdest Crawford <laughs> was not available for the all-name team on our first signing day, but goodness, <laughs> will he make it on the next one if we were to do one. Anyways, <laughs> let's get an idea of what Jaden Gold had to say on why he chose the Cornhuskers. They have a great history. I mean, obviously, that's what we're looking to get back to, honestly. I mean, Coach, uh, Coach Tom uh, Osborne, I mean, he's really, like, he really built a legacy here. So, I mean, like, I'm really excited to try to build back up to that place that he had it at. And, I mean, obviously, I mean, look at Coach Frost. I mean, he's won national championships here. Like, that's what we're trying to do. I mean, that's the goal. So, we're working every day to get back to that level that Nebraska was once at, which was a powerhouse. So, we're just going to keep working, keep grinding, and that's what we're trying to achieve. Well, there's no way to hide. If you look at recent years, this is not the best class that Scott Frost has brought in. In fact, it is pretty clearly the worst one he has brought in. 
41st nationally, 10th in the Big Ten. But there are some reasons behind that. For example, it is a lower number of scholarships of freshman players than they normally give out. Here's Scott Frost back on the first signing day explaining to us why. We knew we were going to sign a smaller class this year. Uh, with all our kids getting COVID years back, um, we definitely want to keep some spots available uh, to try to find uh, maybe some more kids that can be immediate help. Uh, so we're really selective. Uh, we wanted to try to sign the best kids that we could out of the state of Nebraska and the area. Uh, some, some kids that we thought were uh, high potential kids down the road and, and also keep some spots in our back pocket. At anytime you got uh, chips left and you got a seat at the table there and kids come available, you got more chances. And I would suspect we're not done yet for the year. There's a, a ton of kids in the portal right now already. It's hard to keep track of all of them. You know, that, that's the era of college football we're in right now. And, and we have to do a good job of trying to adjust to the, the new way of recruiting. And uh, this will be our, our first time really uh, diving into it and, and trying to to make a difference on our football team uh, through the portal. Now this class looked really, really disappointing a month ago, but they made some big changes recently, including this recent flip on signing day. Janarian Bonner was supposed to go to Georgia Tech, but he flipped to Nebraska on this second signing day. He's a top 50 wide receiver in the country, top 500 ranked player overall, comes from the talent rich state of Georgia. So that helped boost their numbers up to 41. It was in the low 50s at one point, just a handful of weeks ago. Still disappointing for Nebraska standards. However, they did, as Coach Frost alluded to, Jerry, go to the transfer portal. One of the guys they picked up is a guy who started 10 games in the Big 12 last year. Had some chips left and a seat at the table, I think, <laughs> what Coach Frost said. Right, so let's, let's look at Casey Thompson from Texas. Obviously, this is an entirely different evaluation. The tape is different. They're, they're playing a game at a different level. So saving some scholarships, not having a big class in December, this is what Scott Frost had in mind. This is the new transfer portal right here. You can see Casey Thompson coming into Nebraska, replacing Martinez, who went transfer portal in his own right, uh, Alan. This is where it's going. I mean, you are recruiting guys that have played on the big stage. It's just so much different. Yeah, and they've done that in the defensive backfield as well, which is the position group that's maybe going to have the most changes from last year into this year. Tommy Hill, we mentioned coming in from Arizona State. He's one of their highest-ranked transfers, one of the highest-ranked transfers in the entire Big Ten. But don't forget about a guy named Omar Brown either. He's coming in from Northern Iowa, played immediately as a true freshman and was the FCS Defensive Freshman of the Year that had six interceptions that year. So he brings starting experience. He brings size between Omar and Tommy. A couple of junior college transfers, a high school guy like Jaden Gould, they've immediately upped the talent level and the size and athleticism level in that secondary room. Well, if you're spending any time around Coach Frost, you know, his patience is where it's thin really quickly, and he wants to start winning right now. And you look at those wide receivers that he brought in, they're going to immediately be able to help. The quarterback position is going to be an immediate help. They just have to not turn the football over. But they're used the portal to go back and try to fill in some of those holes and some of those needs to players who left the program, quite frankly. So you had to replace those guys because you had scholarships. But it's important for these guys to be able to come in and produce right away because it's about winning right now. You know, it's interesting. Scott has done this a little non-traditional. You know, Tom Osborne was a great recruiter, but he was a non-traditional recruiter. First of all, he had this incredible walk-on program that really supplemented his roster. I mean, they had, they, he may have had 100 walk-ons at the <laughs> team at a certain time. He took guys that weren't qualified as freshmen, and he, and he developed them. Scott Frost went to Stanford before he transferred to Nebraska. So I think you give Scott Frost a lot of credit for looking at his situation a little non non-traditional, not being afraid of being ranked maybe 14th in December in recruiting right. because he knew this was his plan. We're doing a good job in state as well. And, yeah. you know, the numbers aren't where they are in other states, but going in and getting the guys in state that you want is important. And then you can go out and be able to recruit the guys that you want to fill those certain needs. Now, the Michigan recruiting classes the last four seasons have been pretty darn good. Three of them in the top ten, including this class. The 2022 group is eighth in the country. And we've talked to some pretty good players on signing day, as you can see there. We're glad to bring in another pretty good player. He is Jimmy Rolder, and he is joining us to talk about being a Michigan Wolverine. Jimmy, when did you know during the process, this is it, I'm choosing Michigan? I mean, after my the first time I was up there, it just 
it felt like such a family vibe and just uh, getting connect, being able to connect with all the coaches and just uh, the players after the game, after just an unofficial visit, I just, it just felt like a great environment for me. What was it like when you would have your chats in your recruiting process with Jim Harbaugh specifically? Um, definitely, definitely some goofy chats, but, um, <laughs> I mean, he, he just felt, uh, like welcoming, like since the first time we talked, um, cause the first time I actually, uh, communicated with him is, uh, when he offered me. So just, he was like trying to get to know me like on the spot. And we had like a 20 minute conversation where, um, we just like really connected and uh, it just felt like a, a good spot for me to be. Give me an example of what was goofy. I mean, just just some just some represent references and just silly stuff he says. I mean, uh, just I don't know, just his personality. It's just welcoming and funny and goofy. All right, so here's the big question: What was the last time you talked to him? Um, well, I was up there on my official visit, despite being signed already this past weekend. So I got to talk with him. Um, Pretty much every day I was out there. Are you concerned about all these NFL discussions he's having? Um, I mean, obviously, like, I want him to be my coach, but um, I can't really – I don't really have a say in whether he goes or not, but um, it's his choice. Uh, they'll definitely hire another great coach in replacement if he does leave, but – um, that's pretty much my take on that. That, that feels like a, a tough spot for you, though, right? Because on the one hand, he's clearly the higher status. But on the other hand, you'd like to know. You'd like to ask him what his plans are and get an honest answer, right? Yeah, but, I mean, I honestly think he'd be a great fit just, like, in college football. But if he wants to go win a Super Bowl, then, I mean, no one's going to stop him there, especially with his reputation when he was with the 49ers. His record and everything showed for itself. How much did you watch Michigan in your high school career? I mean, whenever it was on, I was I love watching, you know, since I was a kid. But I mean, I didn't really start watching a whole lot until this year after really seeing if I seeing that I was capable to play at a high level like Michigan. So really just started this past season heavily. What was it like watching the Ohio State Michigan game? I mean, it was crazy because uh, I was actually there in person. So it was the <laughs> best atmosphere I've ever been to. <laughs> Tell me about it. What was it like? I mean, the snow coming down, just it was the loudest, uh, like with all the fans there and everything. Everybody was screaming. Um, just it was just a domination. And I mean, to beat your rivals like that after so many years, it, it was something special to see. And then storming the field afterwards, it was it was crazy. Were you on the field? Yeah, it was tight in there. Like, so I couldn't get out of there. I was trying to get to the locker room. It took me like half an hour. <laughs> yeah, that's what happens with a 100,000 person congestion, I suppose. Um, yeah. You more excited about playing in that stadium or putting on that helmet? Oh, my God. I mean, both. I mean, getting able to put on that Michigan uniform, and just playing there for that, that 100,000 plus crowd every weekend. I can't wait. You were committed to play college baseball. What changed? I mean, I just, I always knew I liked uh, love football from the start. And um, with the COVID, or with when COVID happened, I was a sophomore and um, I wasn't sure if I was going to get another shot to play uh, football in high school because um, my season got canceled in, that, in the fall coming up and I decided to play fall baseball. And um, when I got the scholarship from Illinois, I didn't think that I was going to have another opportunity to prove myself, to play football. So I kind of took it as um, like my chance to play at the next level in any sport. But I knew at heart I always wanted to play football. So I was very uh, um, pleased and uh, thankful to have the opportunity to do what I'm doing right now. So. Before I let you go, give me a true false on this one. Has this become myth or did this really happen? Your first high school varsity snap was as a sophomore in a playoff game and you got a sack. Yeah, that is true. That is true. <laughs> That's a nice introduction, huh? Oh, yeah. So real good. Jimmy, we appreciate this introduction from you. We hope you have a great time in Ann Arbor. No matter who your head coach is, we hope you stay in touch. Thanks, man. Thank you for having me. 
Jimmy's a part of a really talented group. Again, top 10 in the country. He's a defensive standout at linebacker, but so is Will Johnson, one of the top 20 players in the country, the top player from the state of Michigan. Derek Moore, also on the defensive side from Baltimore, the number two player from Maryland. Keon Sab, top 10 safety in the country. There are some really, really good guys here. Specifically, Alan, I know you got your eye on that guy on the top. Yeah, we talked about Will Johnson, the first signing day, because he's the top prospect in the class. But now that uh, time has developed and we know Vincent Gray is declared for the draft, I think he becomes even more important. This is an easy pick as an instant impact guy because the opportunity is there for him and he's ready. He's going to come in at six foot three, 200 pounds. He's on campus already, four year varsity starter in high school, has trained alongside top athletes really since his middle school, maybe even elementary school days. So he's going to come in very well schooled, very smart, very big. I think he's an instant impact guy. Tyler Morris, wide receiver in this class. You can see him here. Really does a great job of tracking the ball, keeping his feet in bounds. That was really well done. You're going to see here, he adjusts his speed. The ball's a little further thrown than we thought, and he speeds it up. Just has a great feel for where the ball's going. And then every wide receiver nowadays has got to be able to run after the catch, because this is a popular play <laughs> that everybody's running, and he can certainly do that. He, he, he's a really good player going in there. Look at the Big Ten East rankings. Again, the Buckeyes and Penn State had the top two classes, but Michigan right behind them there with the eighth class nationally. And by the way, you know, some people have said this about Jim Harbaugh. He wasn't a great recruiter. This is the fourth time he's had a top 10 ranked class nationally in his seven years as the head coach at Michigan. But Michigan State is also rising up in the rankings. You see them 22nd nationally. They got a quarterback in Caden Hauser who's really talented. He explains now why he's wearing the green and white. I chose Michigan State because of the brotherhood and the culture here. I mean, I took my visit up here and just walking around the town of East Lansing and seeing all the fans and just seeing the culture in the building and the focus and from the team and stuff like that. I feel like it's just a great place to be and I, I'm excited to be a Spartan. I can't wait to get to work. Obviously, the goal here is to win some national championships, but each and every day you got to come in and put the work. So right now I'm just working day by day to see what I can do to better myself each and every day. But the end goal is to win a national championship. This is an excellent group for Michigan State. They doubled the amount of top 1,000 ranked players in this year's class compared to last year's class. Phenomenal in the state of Michigan. Number three, number five, number six, number nine best players from the state. This is really a very impressive haul for Michigan State. You're looking at a top 25 class, which they haven't done since 2016. And the man bringing in those great commits is Mel Tucker, who joins us now. And Mel, let me start with this. You're doing it backwards. It's not supposed to work this way. You don't have a two and five year, and then that next cycle bring in great recruits. You're supposed to have a bad recruiting year. After going two and five. How did you do no. this? No, I mean, you know, uh, people, they understand that, that uh, our circumstances and and they, they see that we've shifted the culture and and then we have a process and we have a plan and and then uh and, and they, they really connect with well with our coaching staff and our support staff and and then also the players that are here you know they 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 uh they talk with them and uh, the recruits and their parents ask them you know what's it like at michigan state and what's the staff like how's coach tuck and and they tell them you know they're authentic with them and tell them the truth and and so that resonates with with the recruits and their, and their families and and so we're able to uh to sign a whole bunch of good players you certainly did. And when you break down where they come from, you got a lot from the state of Michigan. But I noticed yeah. outside of Michigan, barely any from the Midwest. The, if it was in Michigan, it was in the Midwest. Otherwise, it was way beyond the Big Ten footprint. Is that just a coincidence of where things happened or is that sort of your plan? No, I, I think it's just, you know, you go where the players are, uh, where you have, where you have uh you know, connections where, you know, where people, you know, know you know, recruiting is so much about relationships and, and trust and things like that. And so, you know, we have coaches from all over the country that, that come from all over the country that, you know, have uh, have recruited all over the country. And, and so, um, you know, we, we use our contacts, we use our network and, and then we and, and we, we recruit coast to coast and, and we recruit the south and and, uh, you know, we go we go where the players are. Let me ask you about an in-state kid, defensive lineman Alex Van Summeren. What makes him special? Yeah, he's a he's a high motor guy. He's here. He's already here, actually. And and uh, I saw him this morning, and he looked like he was ready to go 
hit somebody like this morning. We're in shorts. <laughs> he was he walks he walked he walked into the indoor and he had his game face. So I said, "Bro, are you ready to go right now?" He's like, "Yeah, I'm ready to go right now." I mean, he is a hot motor guy. He's like a uh, you know high energy. Uh, he's really good initial quickness. He's tough. He's physical. I mean, the guy can run. I mean, he's a he's a guy that can do a lot of a lot of different things. I'm really glad that we have him. And his, and his brother's here also, you know, playing linebacker. You went out west to get a QB, Caton Hauser, played at a powerhouse high school. What caught your eye with him? Oh shoot, he's just he, he's he's a very talented guy. He's got the, he's got really good arm strength. He's accurate with the ball. He's got a football mind. It's high football IQ. He's a football. He doesn't just love football. He lives it. Um, and he, he can make all the throws, uh, you know, just just really good command of what he's doing. He's a hard worker. He's very focused. He's very mature uh, for his age. What's it like going after someone like Antonio Gates Jr., who has a father who is a football guy, famous and very successful? Yeah, it was very interesting. I mean, Antonio was here. Antonio Sr. was here at Michigan State when I was a graduate assistant in 97, 98. And so you know, I've known him. And then I coached against him, you know, uh, when I was in the National Football League. And so he knew about me. Uh, he knows me. I know him. And, and so we talked. And, and the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, obviously. <laughs> I mean, Junior is a heck of a player. I mean, he is a football guy. Uh, I mean, he can he can do a lot. I mean, he's I mean, he's not just, you know, a one dimensional guy. I mean, you put this guy anywhere on the field, he's going to make plays, offense or defense. You know, when you look back at what you do with the transfer portal next year, I don't know, that Walker kid at running back was OK. You know, <laughs> he did all right, I guess, if, you know, being one of the best in the country is your goal. What would you say is your philosophy when it comes to the portal? Well, it's, it's very similar to uh, to what we did in the in the National Football League for my ten years there. You know, we you want to build through the draft, uh, and then you're going to supplement and complement your roster with with free agency. You know, where you need immediate need, you know, difference makers. We're doing the same thing here. We're going to build our roster through the high school ranks, but we're going to use the portal uh, to to fill some immediate needs uh, and uh, for some impact players. Um, and, and, you know, we're going to, they're going to compliment each other. And, and that's the new age of, of college football. And we've been, we've embraced it, um, from day one, you know, we anticipated it, you know, we've got a philosophy, um, you know, we have a structure in place that allows us to, to do a great job in the high school ranks and also in the portal. Um, and, and our Saeed Khalif and our recruiting staff and our coaching staff, they just do a great job of roster management, you know, recruiting, evaluation, and just, and just bringing it all together. And that's why we're able to, to sign some really good players. What stands out to you from the transfers you're bringing in this year? Guys that are they're hungry. They got they got a chip on their shoulder. Uh, they're they're here for the right reasons. They know what they're getting into. Um, they wanted to be here at Michigan State, um, and and they're they're gonna they're gonna help us win some football games. There's no doubt about that. You know I can't relate to these guys who are six three three hundred, but I did <laughs> see you signed a top ten kicker. What do you like about him? Yeah. Yeah, I mean he's he's a he's a great guy. He's a great guy. He's he's hyper competitive, um, and you know he's he's an athlete, and and, and he, it's like he doesn't have a kicker's mentality, so to speak. Um, he, I mean he's a he's a foot he's a he's a football player, and he and he's a he's a competitor, and he's a tough guy, um, and he, you know he's got a strong leg, and 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 uh, I mean we're really happy to have him. I mean, you know offense, defense, special teams, your specialists, you know kickers, punters, long snappers. The holders. I mean, it's just a just a huge part of the game, and so we have to be strong at every single position. And so he's going to allow us to, to be that way. Mel, before I let you go, uh, you look good in everything. But last year on signing day, we had that tight green jacket. That was <laughs> a heck of a look. I'm just putting in an early request for next year if the jacket can come back. Uh, we'll we'll see what we can do. I'll I'll, I'll write that down and. And uh, I aim to please. So well, I'll, do, I'll do the best I can. <laughs> I'm sure it's your top priority. Mel, congrats on what was a great class. Thanks for giving us some of your time. Yeah, thank you so much. The best is ahead. Go green. All right, I mentioned the recruiting map. There's so much on the state of Michigan. But like I said, not much else in the Big Ten footprint. They didn't get anyone from Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Ohio. Got a ton from Georgia, some from Florida, Texas, Nevada, Zona, Colorado, California. They went all over. But it does say something, Jerry, about his style of recruiting. 
which is different from the guy that he replaced in Mark D'Antonio. Yeah, it's drastically different. Now, this year they signed six players from Michigan, and Michigan only signed one. But if you go back the last four years, Michigan State averages five, Michigan averages three. So neither one of them really make a living in state. The real departure from what Mark D'Antonio did is Mark D'Antonio wanted to be about a 300-mile radius. He wanted everybody he signed to come to their camp, to come to games. He wanted to visit with them. He wanted to be around them. Whereas Coach Tucker obviously isn't built that way, and he will go wherever he wants. So historically, Michigan State has always signed more players in state than Michigan. I mean, this goes way back. I'm not sure that's going to hold up any longer. I think Mel answered it best when he said, we just go where the players are. If there weren't <laughs> six players in state he wanted, it wouldn't matter to him. He would sign none. And so that's a departure. I think it's going to be a successful formula. Yeah, I think one of the players that he went after, and you talk about Chase Carter being a player that really is a player that can step up and make plays. And he's long, really athletic, undersized right now at just 225, 230 in that area. But he's long and rangy, and I think once he can get into the weight room and continue to work and build that body, he's going to be really an effective player for them coming off the edge. But you just see how explosive he is with that first step and how physical he can be at the point of attack at the high school level. It's going to be fun to watch this young man develop. One thing I've learned about this staff is it's never over. And Jeremy Bernard is a great, yeah, in recruiting. And Jeremy Bernard is a great example of that. He was signed to Washington, was granted a release. They went back after him. He had a, a pre existing relationship with the quarterback, Kayton Hauser. They actually played uh, on a youth seven on seven team, a factoid that I'm sure you're going to hear all about in the next four <laughs> years. But a big physical receiver already on campus. I think he's going to have a chance to play right away and was a really, really good pickup at the end. And it's worth reiterating what I mentioned at the top to him. This is their third best class for the program in the modern era. This was without the benefit of an 11-win season, which they had this year. That affects the following year's class. He did this coming off a 2-5 and five season. Future looks bright in East Lansing. Here's a look at the Maryland Terrapins. Who are they bringing in? They got a guy on the first signing day, Jay Sean Barham from Maryland, one of the top 10 linebackers in the country. Shalik Knotts, one of the best nicknames around. Punch! is his nickname. Lockley told us he's got Dante Demas type skill set and Ramon Brown, a four-star running back from Virginia. Here's Mike Lockley on why this class is so important. There's a ton of great players here in the DMV region, and, and because of the type of brand Maryland has, uh, we feel nationally we should be able to go get players as well. But I think it starts with putting a great product on the field, and this is the class that I feel will become the DNA of our player-driven culture that we're trying to continue to create here at Maryland. When you look at the makeup of this class as a whole, a lot of them come from winning programs that they help build, which is very similar to what we're trying to create here. Uh, a lot of captains in this group, you know, when we did our research, I think over 70% of this class were all captains. And to me, I just think as we take the next step with our program, it's going to start with us creating that player-driven culture that's needed to, to become a championship-type team. Well, here's a look at the map for where Maryland has done. They did go down to Florida, but Howard, it's pretty clear what makes Mike Lockley a successful recruiter. He knows the talent right in his backyard. Absolutely, and DMV is a heavily t uh, recruited area, and he understands that, but he talks about being able to develop some of those relationships. And you, Coach, you've mentioned this as well. You may not get that guy the first time around, but you do a great job of recruiting that school and recruiting those players and doing the right things. You're going to have the opportunity to come back into the school and get some other players, and that's what's really been important. He's a guy who has deep ties to the DMV area and greatly respected on the recruiting trail. So that's an area where he's always going to be able to do well. Yeah, we just talked about Michigan State being a school that you can never really close the book on in a recruitment. Maryland is the same way. I think it was on the <laughs> first day of the early signing period a few years ago when they flipped Rakim Jarrett. It was a big deal. Did the same thing this year with Jay Sean Barham, who is uh, the top guy in this class. He was committed to South Carolina, was looking at a couple of different schools. Maryland gets him on December 15th, first day of the early signing period. Since then, he has really validated his status as a top recruit in this class. Went down, out to the Polynesian Bowl in Hawaii and one of, was one of the top performers out there. He's not an early enrollee, but I still think he can play early. Six foot three, 230 pounds, so physically ready to go. Comes from a very talented St. Francis program there in Baltimore.
Jacob Copeland transferred from Florida. He was Florida's leading rusher last year. When you're recruiting a high school player, you know, you, you, you try to explain what we're doing offensively, what it's like, what's the technique. When you recruit someone like Copeland and, and you're at Maryland and you're a wide open offense and you're Michael Loxley and Dan Enos and you know exactly what you're going to have to do when you get there. You can talk about uh, routes and techniques. It's just so much different. It, it, it's about talking about someone that's two or three years removed from high school that was a leading receiver in an SEC school. This is a perfect example of when Coach Loxley and Danny Enos were at, were at Alabama. You best believe they were recruiting this young man, mm -hmm. and now they have the opportunity to bring him to Maryland. He is a guy that we mentioned, and it's ending his third year at Maryland, focuses heavily on his own backyard. This is the first year coming to a close for Brett Bielema. He also has made it very clear from day one they are going to focus on their backyard, which is the state of Illinois. Uh, there's a handful of guys to focus on here. Jared Beatty, great high school player too. Tall guy, 6'5", ran a 4'5", 40. Sean Miller, someone they got from Arizona, from Arizona area, but he played last year at prestigious IMG down in Florida. Brett Bielema has a lot of in-state kids. Here he is on the first signing day explaining to us why. We're trying to represent the state of Illinois. Uh, and to have Illinois players in this class was huge. Um, you know, as we look back at it, we actually went to three different countries, uh, eight different states, but the 10 players from the state of Illinois are the backbone of what we believe in. Uh, kind of have them sprinkled in, offense, defense, all different positions, and, and it's going to be a great representation to our fan base uh, that we're trying to appeal to. Now we got to get Champaign, got to get Memorial Stadium rocking. We've played well on the road, but we want to play well at home. To win the Big Ten West, you have to win at home against Big Ten West opponents, and that's what we need to do. Look at what Illinois did and how much of it was in state. 11 players from the state of Illinois. And the other good thing, too, was not just kids, but good kids. I mean, last year, the year before, and the year before that, if you look at top 20 kids from the state of Illinois, they got one. This year, Howard, they got three of the top 20 kids. And it's something that Brett literally said the first day he was hired, which is a drastic shift from Lovey Smith. Lovey just didn't focus on Illinois. Brett said it's going to be one of his top priorities. I think when you go back and look at the history of Illinois football and some of their better teams that have gone on and competed in bowl games or ranked in the top 10, there were teams that were heavily dominated by guys from the state of Illinois, Indiana, and Missouri. And those are areas where you have to continue to concentrate. But as you mentioned, lately, the Illinois kids couldn't get offers to Illinois, let alone have an opportunity to sign there. Now Coach Bielema recognizing recognized the importance of those in-state players because you're going to need those guys to be able to go out and win. I think when you talk about in-state recruiting too, you want to get the top guys in your home state, but what really endears you to the high school coaches in that state and something some of the other Big Ten schools have done a really good job of is when you mine for talent inside the state. You don't just skim the top. And Illinois did that towards the end of this class. James Crutes, linebacker, really, really good example of that, was a guy who did not have any offers as his senior year was moving along, but had an outstanding year, was the Catholic League Defensive Player of the Year. 137 tackles as a senior. He is the son of uh, NFL Pro Bowler Olin Crutes. His brother Josh is on the Illinois team. So there were some connections there, but listen, he can stand on his own two feet, on his own merits as a football player. He was a good find for Illinois. Sean Miller, wide receiver. Uh, you know, Brett Bielema was running a different offense than he ran uh, when they were at Wisconsin. So this is, this is a little bit different here. This is some of the stuff that he's doing now. He's breaking the formation. You see a really good route run by Sean. This is another popular route that uh, everybody nowadays is running a wide receiver screen. So Sean is a really good fit for what they're doing offensively. If you go big picture on the Big Ten, 50 states, the number one state in terms of players going to the Big Ten is Florida. The number two state is Illinois. 24 kids are going to Big Ten programs from Illinois. That's why that matters so much to Brett Bielema. Here's a look at the Northwestern Wildcats and what they are bringing in with this class. Wide receiver Reggie Florima comes from in-state. He's a Naperville kid, four-star player. His dad played in the 1990s at Notre Dame under Lou Holtz. They got an edge in Anto Saka, four-star kid who picked Northwestern over USC and Penn State. Here's Pat Fitzgerald on what his focus was for this class. We needed to make sure that we solidified the line of scrimmage. We feel like we did that with 
you know, the six big guys that, uh, that we're bringing in here uh, in the early signing period, four on defense and two on offense. It's really been a, a, a staple for us as we won two out of the last four Big Ten West championships. And, you know, getting back to the competitive depth that we need, we feel excited about those guys in the trenches. We're back. I'm fired up about this class and couldn't be more excited about where we're going as a program. No matter who you are, if there is one position people are interested in finding out who their future is, it is the quarterback position. What did we learn about that position with this class? Well, it's an interesting one for Northwestern, I think, in this class because they've been pretty portal heavy when it comes to the quarterback position. But they got a guy out of high school this year, late in the process, who not a lot of people knew about, who I think is one of the sleepers in the entire conference. And Jack Lausch out of Brother Rice from right here in Chicago had an outstanding senior year. He passed for nearly 2,500 yards, rushed for over 1,000 yards. He's a dual threat guy, uh, was committed to Notre Dame for baseball. Northwestern offered him in football after his senior year. Really smart, really mobile. I think he's a guy who they can develop, and they're going to have him for four years. Saka's a player that can play off the edge. See how quick he is with that first step, really finishes at the end. I think he's one of those guys that they need, talking about being able to try to control the line of scrimmage and be disruptive. You need to be able to get in and be able to penetrate. And you see a lot of that. He plays low, is strong, again, as I mentioned, at the point of attack, and someone that I believe is going to be able to help this program immediately. This is a pretty typical Northwestern class. Yep. They're, they're ranked 49th. They're usually 50, 51, 47, around there. I think a couple things. They've lost eight people in the portal last time I looked and gained three. I don't think they'll be as active in the portal as some other schools, and I think part of that is an academic piece. And the other thing we talk a lot about is facilities. You know, and they, they built this facility, I think, two, three years ago. Uh, their recruiting hasn't really been impacted. And I say this all the time. A beautiful facility helps your day-to-day and helps the players that are earning in, in your program. A great facility, there's better reasons to go to Northwestern. It's a great university than just the facility. And so the facility really hasn't helped them. They're pretty much the same as they were before they moved in to that facility. But again, they're ranked 49th. That's about where they are every year. Almost every class with Pat Fitzgerald is in that same group in terms of the Big Ten rankings, the national rankings. And we're used to by now, this, he's starting his 17th year. I mean, how incredible is that? His 17th year now in charge of Northwestern will be this coming fall. P.J. Fleck is about to start his sixth year in charge of the Gophers. Here's a look at what they're bringing in. A bunch of defensive guys up top, like Trey Bixby, the number two player in the state of Minnesota, and Anthony Smith, a couple big D linemen. You add in Hayden Schwartz as well. Here's P.J. Fleck from the first signing day on what he thinks the strength of his group is. We kind of spread it out across the board, uh, a little bit secondary heavy with some of our, uh, our corners leaving. Uh, we're a little bit more experienced at the corner position, so uh, filling those holes. Obviously, playing in the Big Ten West and playing in the Big Ten, you've got to be able to be good up front, so our offensive and defensive line, and then we just kind of scattered it uh, across the board there. Those guys are going to come in, and hopefully some of them can, can, can play and can contribute as a freshman. Anthony Smith is an incredibly athletic young man. You know, when you kind of look at the, the epinesis of the world and um, you look at Purdue's defensive linemen, you know, the defensive ends in our league have gotten better and better and better, and I think Anthony Smith's got a chance to be one of those guys as well as you know Hayden Schwartz. And then Trey Bixby, I mean, he was a, a kid that's from Minnesota, left, went to Ohio, came back uh, to Minnesota, Eden Prairie High School, and, and can really rush the passer and uh, another long player. So that bigger, long physique is what we are looking for that, can, uh, that is really athletic, that can really give us that staple at the defensive end position. And, and some of them, who knows how big they're going to be able to grow, maybe down to a three technique or so. But I think the defensive end position was really an emphasis for us. Well, let's break down some of the players that stand out to us. You had your eye on Anthony Smith. How come? Yeah, Coach mentioned the athleticism. A multi-sport guy, was a really good basketball player, also really outstanding in track and field. Uh, six foot five, 280 pounds, and being able to do that in those different sports, I think he has a chance to be a difference maker. I, I agree with Coach that the defensive line is one of the strengths of this class with him. Trey Bixby and Hayden Schwartz, and they've done a really good job of developing this position when you look at guys like uh, Sezioto Maywo, Boye Moff. Those guys were not highly ranked recruits. Those were three-star guys that they've done a really, really good job with. You look at Quinn Carroll, who they went into the portal and got from Notre Dame. He is a big physical guy, was a top 200 type player when he was coming out of uh, high school, four-star, high four-star. So this is a player that really can help them immediately be able to play at the point of attack. They, you know they want to be physical, run the football. They've got a guy in him that they can run behind. 
You know, P.J. just finished his fifth year. You know, I'm surprised their recruiting hasn't gotten better. You know, he's the 47th in the country. They're 13th in, in the West Division. You know, he's such an unusual guy and has such an unusual style that when he first got to Minnesota, I think a lot of people were attracted to it. They built a brand-new facility, which is really well done. But honestly, to be the sixth in the, in the West, 47th nationally, after five years, you know, when they had that really great year a couple of years ago, I thought they could have built a little bit more on the momentum. Let's take a look overall at the Big Ten in terms of how they did. And, yeah, they got just about every state possible. <laughs> I mentioned nowhere more impacted than the state of Florida. They grabbed 37 kids from the south. But look at Texas, Georgia, Illinois, Pennsylvania. There's a lot of states that produced a lot of Big Ten. New Mexico. Think we yes. can get one. Step up, Montana. Montana. Goodness sakes. Uh, let's get some final thoughts on this 2022 class now that it's come to a close. Well, I think uh, everything continues to change. You know, we had uh, some changes in the way kids got recruited because of COVID. There were guys committing to schools when they hadn't even visited the schools. Now you have the transfer portal. Everybody continues to roll with the punches. Re recruiting continues to move on. Kids generally still picking schools for the same reasons, but the way they get recruited continues to change and develop. Yeah, three schools jump out at me. Iowa won being number one in the West when in early December it didn't look like they were a very good class. And you hear all the things going on in the Iowa program. They must have good morale inside. Tom Allen, I mean, I think he has to be the recruiter of the year in the Big Ten, having the 21st class. And Michigan's so interesting that they're going to have a top class, and yet they don't know who their coach is going to be. And we're, we're – uh, on the second signing day. Yeah, you talk about Michigan State, right? And that was a team that I really had an eye on when COVID started because that's when they weren't necessarily able to have the players on campus or they weren't able to have them on campus at all. But because you can build relationships, that's the one thing, Alan, it has not changed and will never change when it comes to recruiting. Building relationships with the young people and their families is going to be key to you being able to have an outstanding class. I think Tom Allen's an example of that yeah. as well. I'll say. The numbers are starting to show that <laughs> for sure <laughs> in Bloomington. Um, you know, one sort of big treetop thing. Ten years ago, there were five Big Ten classes in the top 40. Five. This year, there are nine with one of the groups almost there and making it 10 at like 41-42. Yeah. It's the third straight year that the Big Ten has had nine teams in the top 40. Obviously, the Big Ten always wants to get better. There are always going to be higher marks you can get. But in a decade, that is a huge yeah. jump for a conference that, if you remember 10 years ago, desperately needed to make that jump.